I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Business Blaze. This one is brought to you by the legends over at Magellan TV. Oh yes, our friends over at Magellan have been kind enough to sponsor this episode. And they'd like me to tell you a thing or two about their fine service. Magellan TV is basically, it's a streaming service. It's like, you know, I don't know if I, normally they say don't name competitors, but I don't know if the big one that begins with an N is uh, a competitor because it, I mean, they've got documentaries and stuff, but it's like, you know, it's mostly, I don't want to, I don't want to like rag on it. But there's some truly awful reality TV that is made by and broadcast on the network, the the, the network, the, the streaming service, the the big N. Look, Magellan TV though, they're not like that. They're a street, well they are like that, but they're also different and better for big brains. Um, this is off the wall already. But basically it's founded by filmmakers who actually like history. So rather than some guy being like, mm, I've got a brilliant way to get rich. They're people, I mean, maybe, I, I guess it does both for them, which is fantastic. They're film Filmmakers who really like history and they're like, let's put together a streaming service for other big brains like us. And uh, like, hopefully you. They've got 3,000 excellent programs available on their service and it's hard to stop watching once you start. That's true. I don't know, I feel like anything good is hard to watch, stop watching once you start. But Magellan TV, I think basically they just got lots of good stuff. So you do end up on a bit of a binge. Uh, they've got everything from the Greeks to the Great War, plus modern history, biography, scientific profiles, true crime. <laughs> and so much more and more new content every week. Oh, what was I gonna recommend? Oh yeah, Meet the Romans. So this is a, uh, I mean, I chose this one because it's, I mean, it's sort of tangentially related to the past was the worst, but it looks at like the everyday lives of Romans, the citizens, I think it's like three or four episodes. They're each quite long and it like just looks at the lives of different Romans and what it was like. And uh, you'll be like, glad it's the present, to be honest. I mean, interesting. But glad it's the present. All right, now you guys can get a one month free trial by clicking on the link in the description below. It's content for days and days. So let Magellan hook you up. You'll be glad that you did. Like I say, there's a link below one month free trial. This episode is the past was the worst. Uh, it's a catchphrase that I really enjoy. It comes up often on this channel. People are like, oh man, I wish it was the past. The past was the best. Carefree, no phones, everyone just living in the moment, having a great time. And then it's like, bro, if you actually think that, you have no idea what the past is or what it was like as horrible. It's almost always objectively worse than today. Yes, there's plenty of problems that society faces, but all of those problems were almost always worse in the past. I mean, you might think, nah, 2018 was nice, no COVID. But other than the more immediate that goes on in the present day, like, oh wow, there was a big terrorist attack. That day, probably worse than the past. But generally speaking, generally speaking, the future is better. We should all be living here and enjoying it. And honestly, you should be sad that you're not born 50 years from now because it's almost certainly going to be better. And people watching in 50 years, hello, I hope my prediction was accurate and that the world hasn't ended, that AI hasn't taken over. 75 years later. <laughs> Why am I just on my own rant here? I've actually been prepared a script from Danny. Thank you, Danny. I'm gonna read it. Sam is gonna sprinkle in some fine vintage memes because that's what we do here on The Blaze. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way. Let's jump in. I have a recurring dream that a lot, oh, it's got a subtitle. History's most horrible inventions and medications. Danny, if you mention cocaine, if you mention cocaine being horrible, be like, can you believe it, Simon? In the past, they used to put cocaine and heroin in drinks. And you could just go to the pharmacy and buy them. I'd be like, Danny, that is not horrible. That is one case where the past was objectively much better because who doesn't love a heroin cocaine drink? Who doesn't? <laughs> I have a recurring dream that a lifelong friend and I finally figure out how to build a time machine and we travel back to our childhood days in Rotherham, a more innocent time when the air tasted of honey and porridge because there's a big factory nearby <laughs> it's like if, it, if the air tastes of honey and porridge it's like i used to go there was this part of london where i used to go to occasionally and there was a giant biscuit factory there and it always smelled of biscuits <laughs> and i was like oh that's nice i mean i wouldn't want to live here it's like living above a kfc it's like yeah yeah great for about five minutes and then you're like is my life just going to be scented with kfc from now on 
Oh, please no. Our main plan is to stock up on all the vintage delicacies that you can't buy anymore today because the manufacturers were out of business or the products were deemed too unhealthy or everyone just got a bit bored of them. If I went back in time, my first priority would be like, look, 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 there's going to be a company called Amazon. Purchase that stock around 1999 and purchase a lot of it. Also, Bitcoin or something. We wanted to track down long forgotten luxuries such as bits of pizza crisps, bottles of panda pops. Oh my God, I remember panda pops. Holy sh we used to get those when we used to go on school trips. Like, you'd go on a trip somewhere with your school and they'd give you a packed lunch. And it was Panda Pops. I think. I'm pretty sure. Yeah! I'm like, why can't we just have Coke? What? It's like Panda Pops Cola. Okay! And it's like, what is wrong with Coke? It's probably like 4p more expensive. And it's not like you're giving us this for free. It's like, I'm sure my parents are getting a bill for that. Why can't we have Coca-Cola? Live the dream. Uh, turkey Twizzlers, He-Man jellies, vanilla ice cream flavored Monster Munch. That sounds f***ing horrific. Actually, no, scrap that last one. They tasted a bit like crunchy sick. Ooh. We figure we can come back with a whole hamper full of stuff because everything was so cheap back then. But we run into a spot of bother with the shopkeeper and he tells us to get our bikes because he doesn't recognize any of our funny modern currency. We should have thought about that in the planning stage. Yeah, you gotta find some weird old currency. I remember, I think maybe I've told this story before, I was working in a shop, some Canadian guy comes in and he gives me like a 20 pound note. I'm like, bro, what is this? Attention Canada, get real money. Don't know what board game this came from, but it's a joke. And he's like, oh, hey, you see, hey, hey, something, something Canadian talk. And he had been there in the 90s and he'd kept this money. And I'm like, bro, one, that is dumb because you should have just translated that back to Canadian dollars <laughs> and put that in the bank because now that money's worth much less and also no one wants this like money that we replaced a long time ago because i'm like i don't know how they do it in canada i know in america it's like if you've got like a, a hundred dollar bill from like 1906 they're gonna be like yeah it's green we'll take it whereas in the uk we're like bro we change our money like every 10 years because there's like crimes and shit which I guess America just doesn't have a problem with. USA. Still, at least we get a chance to wander around the lush green fields of yesteryear before everything got flattered to make way for more council estates and charity shops and kebab houses. And we can pop downtown and have a good nosy around the aisles of Woolworths and WH Smith and Blockbuster. Wait, does WH Smith not exist anymore? I really thought, I mean, I know Blockbuster and Woolworths are the long f***ing on. And honestly, like, Woolworths, what was that store about? And, but I thought WH Smith, I swear, they, do they still have those in adverts? in adverts in airports i swear they do and we can breathe i mean it's been at least a year and a half since i've actually been anywhere on a plane so i guess i wouldn't know <laughs> maybe covid finally pushed wh smith out of business <laughs> honestly it's about time and we can breathe in the atmosphere of a more organized and punctual era in which everyone always made more effort to turn up at the pre-arranged time because it wasn't possible to send an agon send a text announcing that you're running a bit late but after all we suddenly realized that living in the past is a bit shit, really. And so we return to our own time to grab an all-day breakfast from McDonald's. Ah, the future. Uh, if I was back in the past, even like the 1990s, I'd be like, oh, for fuck's sake, how long until I can go back to the future? I miss my phone. You'd just be sitting somewhere and it's like, waiting for a bus. Like, what am I gonna do? Guess I'm just gonna look at nature or like stare at the ground. Whereas now it's like, no, I've got like all of the world's entertainment in my pockets at all the time. Fast is f***ing bad. How dare you? While the past might be an intriguing place to visit, I suspect that most of us wouldn't really want to get stuck there. It would just be too hard to readjust to a world without the internet and insta communication and the entirety of the world's knowledge and archives of entertainment right at our fingertips. You'd have to start visiting the library to find out things, and you'd have to wait for weeks to see if that photograph you'd just taken was any good. I'm sure even the most die-hard nostalgic would quickly get fed up of living in a world with dot matrix printers and typewriters and fanny packs and Hulk Hogan lunchboxes. And things only get worse the further you delve back into history. Yeah, I'm just talking about how we don't like to go to the 90s. You go to the 80s, 70s, 60s, 50s, 40s. Oh my God, it gets up. Immediately in my mind, I'm like, just seeing how I get It's like, yeah, wars, nuclear weapons, actual world wars where tens of millions of people died. And you know I'd almost certainly have gone off to fight in some war, first world war. And then you're getting back to like early 20th century. It's like, we didn't really have a handle on medicine back then. <laughs> it's like, what is this? It's ghosts in the blood! It's like, nah, it's a tumour. Hey, ghost tumour! <laughs> it's like, oh.
You don't really want to spend the rest of your life putting up with all of the truly terrible medical practices and bizarre inventions which were deemed perfectly acceptable in a less enlightened age. But thankfully, you don't see quite as much of that, quite as much of that today. The tonsil guillotine. I've had my tonsils removed. I am sans tonsils. They didn't do it with a guillotine, uh, as far as I'm aware. I was very young. I'd like to think my body has been perfectly streamlined over the years. I've jettisoned some of the useless bits, like my appendix and my tonsils. Yeah, I believe it's not like current medical practice to remove that shit. They, they were like, why are we removing all these tonsils? Uh, and then they moved away from it. I do have my appendix still. Hasn't exploded yet. I'm excited for when it finally does. Ever since I was a little kid, I used to suffer badly with tonsillitis at least twice a year. On the plus side, it meant that I got a month off school every year as I could, and I could sit back and watch the Flintstones all day. The downside was that I was in permanent excruciating pain and had to suck my meals through a straw. Wow, that sounds horrible. I was way too young to, I, I'm, what, having my tonsils removed is one of my earliest memories. So I don't remember the horrible pain. I do remember not being able to speak. Like being like, <laughs> Previously on AMC's The Walking Dead. Ah! I've always been a bit puzzled about how I managed to reach the age of 19 before somebody eventually proposed that maybe I should have my tonsils removed and be spared another 15 years of agony. And while writing the script today, I think I've finally figured out the answer why it took so long. The first day of the operation was quite daunting as the guy in the hospital bed next to me went in first. He was a chirpy and breezy soul, and when they wheeled him in, when they wheeled him in, but they when they wheeled him out again, he was a wailing zombie mess of a man. It's like, oh no! <laughs> we took him in for a tonsillitis and he accidentally got a lobotomy! I don't know why I'm saying this in such a chipper voice. Lobotomies were a horrific procedure that ruins tens of thousands of people's lives? Jesus. Something had clearly gone a bit wrong, and after I'd spent a few hours observing him grunt, whine, squeal, and spit blood, a nurse cheerfully strolled into my ward to tell me it was my turn next. They should put him somewhere else once he's been a... Like, they should have people going in for an operation, and then a separate place for people after the operation, because otherwise everyone's going to be terrified. Fortunately, my own surgery appeared to be much less dramatic. Within half an hour of waking up again, I was already sneaking out of the ward for a crafty cigarette. <laughs> Dude, you just had your tonsils removed. But I might have been more alarmed if my tonsillectomy had been performed at some point during the 19th century and I've been forced to watch in horror as the surgeon whipped out the tonsil guillotine. Removing tonsils has always been considered a tricky and surprisingly controversial procedure. Although it's been practiced under very primitive conditions since 1000 BC. I'd be like, man. You didn't want to have surgery like 100 years ago. You definitely don't want to have surgery 3,000 years ago. Honestly, you don't want to have surgery any time that isn't now. It's getting better all the time. It's not like, oh, there was a golden age of surgery in the 1980s. No, there wasn't. There definitely wasn't. It largely fell out of favor, though, in the Middle Ages, as doctors and patients became increasingly concerned about the wailing and the screaming and the bleeding and the subsequent infections. Yes, ah, infection. <laughs> This is one of the biggest things about the past being the worst. It's like there were no antibiotics. You get an infection and it goes badly, you're f***ed. <laughs> it's just like, what are they going to do? Cut it off? Yeah, but then you got a big open wound that can also get infected. It's like, god damn. And, and then before that, it was like, we didn't even understand what's causing the infection. <laughs> Holy sh**. It just felt for a while that patients were suffering from frequent throat infections were just better off putting up with them. I, it, it was the past, I'd be like, yeah, f*** him in. Like, just, I'm gonna put up with it. But in 1828, the physician Philip Singh Physic, Physic, uh, put tonsillectomies back on the menu with the invention of the new tonsil guillotine. The invention kind of looked like the scariest pair of scissors you'll ever see in your life, complete with menacing sound, ba -da 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 -da, menacing circular hooks which you know are destined to wrap around your diseased throat almonds. After the hook has grabbed hold of your tonsils, a sharp blade is pushed through the hook to slice off the offending lymphoid organ. The good news is that you would first be given a numbing solution containing 4% cocaine. But it only lasted for 30 seconds. The doctor had to work fast in tackling your tonsils. He's like, synchronize watches, boys. Administer the cocaine. And then he's like, wha-bang! And he just whips it in and whips it out. Legend. Uh, tonsillectomy by guillotine was a standard procedure right up until the early 1900s, when again people grew concerned over the heavy bleeding and the infection rate and the high rate of hemorrhaging. Danny, didn't we cover that by saying bleeding? <laughs> I don't know. Aren't those the same things? I'm not a doctor. Yet. <laughs> no, I don't know why I said that. I'm not working on it at all. That'd be weird. Since those dark days, far more reassuring methods have become adopted with nice soothing names like harmonic scalpel and thermal welding and carbon dioxide laser and coblation plasma fields. All of this 
Sounds more like things that are in a physics laboratory rather than a surgeon's operating theater. If someone was like, yep, we're going to do some thermal welding, I'd be like, where? When you're building the operating room? <laughs> but I was surprised to learn that tonsillectomies are still a controversial last resort procedure today, which explains why it took so long for somebody to take mine out. Not for me. They were like three years old. Watching! Worked out fine for me, I think. <laughs> Tonsillectomy rates have dramatically dropped since the 1970s as medical experts believe that the benefits of the procedure can often be outweighed by the risk of bleeding, vomiting, pain, and in very rare cases, death. Holy sh**. God, I really hope the No Business Blaze viewers are getting their tonsils removed after watching this. But if you are, don't panic, it's really not that bad. Just be grateful you're not getting your appendix removed. I fainted from shock when the surgeons first whipped out the appendix electric chainsaw. Holy sh**. Head hacking, oh my. Even today I'd be like, whoa, 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 Elon Musk, what is that weird wire you're gonna put in my brain? <laughs> That's a bit weird. In the past, it is gonna be worse, I promise. At least when Elon Musk puts wires in my brain, it's like at least probably gonna be doing a sterile environment. At least I hope, Mr. Musk. Whereas in the past, they'll be like, sterile what? <laughs> I can clearly remember the first time I accidentally had a lobotomy. Oh, I'm kidding, of course. <clears throat> Brilliant, two jokes about lobotomies, a horrible part of medical history in today's video. <laughs> Thank you, fact boy. Thank you, Danny. <laughs> Cancel, Simon. But I probably had one now by now if I was alive in the 1930s. As the bottom is, ah, woo, ah, COVID. Were all the rage back then? Mental disorder? Lobotomy, baby! Pain and distress, lobotomy! Postnatal depression, lobotomy. Is your kid staring out the window for too long in the classroom? Ah, oh, lobotomy! <laughs> A lot of damage. People have been obsessed with the alleged health benefits of drilling great big f***ing holes in your skulls for thousands of years. But it only became properly fashionable during the 1930s when the Portuguese neurologist Gas Moniz developed a new leucotomy procedure which took small corings from the victim's frontal lobes. He would later receive a Nobel Prize for his efforts, although this is now widely considered a bit of a bad call. A bit like that time the Spice Girls picked up Best Album of the Year at the Billboard Music Awards. I think it's less shocking to me that the guy received a Nobel Prize for the leucotomy uh, because I knew it already. The Spice Girls really got the best album of the year at the Billboard Music Awards. I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. Excuse me, what are you doing? An American physician by the name of Walter Freeman later modified the procedure and coined the term lobotomy and even he... And even though he considered Igas Moniz to be a kind of mentor, it's important to know the water himself was never a qualified neurosurgeon. Exactly the sort of guy I want to be performing neurosurgery on me. Shh. The past. Get it together. He was a bit of a more of a circus showman. He liked drilling holes in people's hands for $25 a pop. He later exchanged the drill for an ice pick when he developed the exciting new transorbital lobotomy. And transorbital means they go around your orbits, which are your eyes. <laughs> so holy sh is the only way to describe that. That's a lot of damage. This involved hammering something resembling a small ice pick into the eye sockets of the lucky patients and then pushing it around a bit to sever the connections between the frontal lobes and the thalamus, which Walter strongly believed was the segment of the brain that handled human emotion. Perfect, exactly what I want someone to do. Yes, put a ice pick around my eye and into my brain and destroy the bit that's responsible for my emotions. Thanks, Walter, you fuck. Big brain. Even today, the elusive complexities of the brain's role in processing emotions is still largely a grey area, but Walter seemed to know what he was doing with his ice pick. <laughs> with all of his neurosurgery degrees. Not. And to be fair, his first demonstration on a live patient in 1946 seemed to work on some level. Saley Ellen Ionesco had been developed displaying violent and suicidal tendencies, but her daughter reported that Sally had found a new calm and peace after water had finished hammering into her eye sockets. But other cases were deemed less than successful. Some patients were left in a vegetative state, or they physically and emotionally regressed. 15% of them actually died shortly after the procedure. Perhaps one of the most famous cases involved Rosemary Kennedy, the sister of soon-to-be President John F. Kennedy. Rosemary had grown up suffering from alleged violent rages, and by the age of 23, she had been packed off to a con school. But the nuns grew concerned that Rosemary kept sneaking out at night. They were fearful that she might even be meeting up with the boys, which could lead to her becoming pregnant or catching a sexually transmitted disease. So rather than being like, Rosemary, don't do that, or if you are, use protection, they were like, ah, forget any of that nonsense. It's time for the ice brick in the brain method, Rosemary. Lie down on the couch. Are we doing this in operating room? Absolutely not. We go around the eyes. Holy shit. 
and people did die, I mean, I believe, because I've talked about this in other videos before, from infections. Because, okay, yeah, you're not cutting the person's brain over open, but you are putting an ice pick thing in the eye. If there's bugs on there, they're gonna go into your brain. It's a bad time. Uh, so her dad, Joseph, clearly had no other option. Without even telling his wife, he asked Walter Freeman to perform a transorbital lobotomy on his daughter. Yeah, he doesn't have to ask his wife. Because it's the past. Am I right, Peter? Following the procedure, Rosemary's mental capacity remained uh, diminished to that of a two-year-old child, and she was institutionalized for the rest of her long life. Rosemary's mum didn't visit her for 20 years, and her dad, Joseph, never visited her at all. In fact, it was only after his death in 1969 that her siblings began to reintegrate Rosemary into the family, after being kept largely in the dark about what had happened to their sister for many years. The details were never revealed to the public until 1987. But none of this stopped Walter Freeman from traveling around the United States, performing up to four thousand of his lobotomies on patients as young as just four years old. Ever the showman, he sometimes liked. Ever the showman, he sometimes li Ever the showman, he sometimes liked to ice pick both eye sockets at the same time, one with each hand. My dude, you are doing brain surgery. Let's just do it one-handed, shall we? We can use the other hand to f steady ourselves, or I don't know. Uh, literally anything else. It's believed that many hospitals and mental institutions are more than happy to let the completely unqualified surgeon perform his magic on uh, on their premises because the lobotomized victims were a bit easier to cope with and didn't quick up, kick up quite so much of a fuss at bedtime. Ah, medical care of the past. Mwah! But he performed his final procedure in 1967 when he accidentally killed one of his patients after severing a blood vessel and he was later banned altogether from carrying out one of the most barbaric mistakes in all of medicine. Lobotomy has thankfully since become largely abandoned around the world after we finally figured out that some of these neurosurgeons and circus ringmasters were just not quite right in their heads. As night falls on a quiet village in Spain in 1898, young Pedro's parents are concerned that the little boy's cough seems strangely persistent. They've tried all the usual cough remedies, but they just don't seem to be shifting it at all. Pedro's mother turns to her husband and says, Well, I suppose there's only one thing left to try, dear. Pedro's father puts down his newspaper and with a sigh says, Ah, lobotomy! Pedro's father puts down his newspaper and with a sigh says, Yes, dear. I'll pop down to the chemist tomorrow and buy a nice big jar of heroin. <laughs> Holy sh I fucking love it. The opiate drug is one of the biggest discoveries to have emerged from Britain. Heroes, right up there with the steam engine, clockwork radio, light bulbs, fish and chips, lawn mower. But although it was the English chemical researcher C.R. Alder Wright who first synthesized diamorphine from the natural morphine of the opium poppy in 1874, nothing much happened with it for the next 23 years. I believe diamorphine or whatever it's called is that's heroin it's like the chemical name for heroin and i believe the uk is the only country in the world where it is a prescription drug like you can be prescribed heroin i think it's for like late stage cancer patients and stuff because it's more powerful than morphine the more you know it was only when german chemist felix hoffman independently resynthesized the stuff in 1897 that heroin was first brought to the market as a morphine substitute for crop depressants it's like oh morphine's a bit too strong what should we use instead Heroin is a non-addictive alternative. Felix worked with the pharmaceutical company Bayer based in Elberfeld, Germany. And it was the company's research department who came up with the brand name Heroin. The name is based on the German word Heroisch, which translates as heroic and strong. How heroin makes you feel. You think that we would have adopted a better name for the drug by now? It's a bit like crack cocaine being globally identified as triumphant sex god gladiator or something. <laughs> ah, crack. Is that crack? Is that what you smoke? <laughs> the company was particularly excited about the launch of their all new jars of heroin, which could be bought over the counter. <laughs> heroin without a prescription. The past, everybody. The great thing about heroin is that it didn't seem to share the worrying addictive qualities of morphine. And history has borne that to be true. Not really. Heroin is very addictive. Is heroin very addictive? I know it's very strong. Um, I assume it's addictive. I don't know if it's more addictive or less addictive than morphine. Uh, and it was considered five times more effective, so everyone's a winner, really. One respected physician exclaimed in the New England Journal of Medicine that heroin was not a hypnotic and carried no danger of acquiring the habit. He'd obviously never seen how awesome heroin is. Over in Spain, Bayer launched a version of aspirin laced with heroin, which was marketed specifically for children. The print adverts featured illustrations of poorly 
poorly cough-stricken kids, feebly reaching across the kitchen table to grab a spoonful of the heroin cocktail that was going to get rid of that cough in no time. It absolutely works, because it's like a, opiates are a cough suppressant, and also a breathing suppressant, which is why you can die from them. <laughs> However, chemists couldn't help but notice that the patients kept coming back to replenish their stocks of heroin like deeply frazzled yo-yos. Can you imagine when they're like, yeah, it's prescription only now? You'd be like, no! I, got a, I, I, I know it's not addictive, but I've got a massive addiction to heroin. <coughs> <coughs> I'm sure it was good for business, but it was still weird that old Mrs. Badger was now trying to purchase her 50th jar of heroin, even though the cough cleared up months and months ago. Is Mrs. Badger like a very typical Spanish name? <laughs> Despite increasing concern from physicians that heroin might just be slightly addictive after all, but I continued to market the brand until 1913. It was eventually banned for non-prescribed medical purposes in the US in 1924, and most of the rest of the world similarly kicked the habit over the years to follow. Here in the UK, though, uh, indeed. Heroin is still prescribed as a strong medication under its gener generic name of diamorphine in very extreme cases such as acute pain, severe physical trauma, end-stage terminal illness, and mild tickly throat. Not really that last one. <laughs> It'd be like, hello doctor, <clears throat> I got a little cough going on. Do you have any diamorphine for me? <laughs> it's like, yes, let me write a prescription. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> The Immortality Machine Finally, here is an invention which should be of interest to Simon as it involves both immortality and dog cruelty. Ooh, two of my favorite topics. While the scientists of today are still wrestling with the solution to not dying, they should perhaps instead take a look back at the 1920s when the cure for mortality appeared to have already been discovered. And who discovered it? It was the big brain communists, of course. Ah, the biggest brain of all the communists. The ha 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 comrade. Sergei Brohangeber. Oh my god. Brachoneko, Brachoneko, Sergei Brachoneko was a Soviet physician and biomedical scientist during the Stalinist era. As the field of physiology was growing at a rapid pace, Sergei was keen to study the workings of human organs, but he ideally needed to keep them functioning after they'd been removed from the host body. Is this the guy who was attaching dogs' heads to other dogs? This guy was crazy. So he invented the autojector in 1925, also known as the immortality machine. This was essentially the world's first heart-lung machine. Made up of oxygen chambers and electric pumps, exhausted blood would be drawn out from a body, warmed and oxygenated for a while in the glass chamber, then pumped back into the dead body part to bring it back to life. Most of Sergei's experiments in this field involved dogs, as it wasn't yet widely accepted at the time that dogs are ten times more important than humans. Ah! Please. Uh, we can apparently see some of Sergei's work in a short propaganda film released by the Soviet Union in 1940 called Experiments in the Revival of Organisms, which is now in the public domain, but I wouldn't recommend watching it. Sam, I'll leave it up to you, buddy. I've seen the video. <laughs> if you want to put it in, you're more than welcome. No. Uh, I found the whole thing very disturbing, and I've usually got a strong stomach for this kind of thing. I managed to get through the whole of Scooby Doo and the Witch's Ghost without flinching once. Hero! <laughs> In one segment of the film, we see a decapitated dog's head getting hooked up to the autojector. After being rejuvenated with oxygenated blood, the dog's head appears to come to back to life and he responds to external stimuli. That's what I remember seeing, and it's creepy. <laughs> it would have been nicer if they'd come up with a more engaging eternal external stimuli than just banging a hammer right next to the dog's isolated head. Uh, the dog appears to be a little startled by the banging, but there's not a great deal it can do about it as it's just a dog's head. <laughs> Without a body, it's so f***ed up. In another segment, all the blood is drained from a perfectly healthy dog until it is brought to clinical death and left alone for 10 minutes. It then gets pumped with the autojector, which miraculously revives the dog and we're led to believe that it goes on to live a long and healthy life. Dude, it's gonna have some massive brain damage. That dog is gonna be f up for life if it survived at all. Some people have questioned the authenticity of the film as none of the technical side of the experiments are shown in any detail. Yeah, that just sounds like propaganda. It's like, if you're not showing the tech, why is anyone watching the film? It's like, either because they're weird. If any scientist watches it, it's like, I want to know the technical details. I don't want to see a weird-ass dog's head being struck with a hammer. I want to know how it's done. Because I'm a scientist, not a f***ing freak. Uh, some of the scientists who witnessed the filming first hand claim the dog's head only survived for a couple of minutes, rather than the hours suggested in the narration. This is probably just because the film is likely to have been a restaging of previous procedures, with more focus on the camera than the science. Apparently, all the well-documented procedures stack up and are believed to be genuine, and Sergei himself was posthumously awarded the Lenin Prize 
for his groundbreaking efforts. That would never be awarded as a propaganda piece. The Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw seemed impressed by the idea. With tongue planted firmly in cheek, he said, I am even tempted to have my own head cut off so I can continue to dictate plays and books without being bothered by illness, without having to dress and undress, without having to eat, without having anything to do, anything to do other than produce masterpieces of dramatic arts and literature. Yeah, I mean, tug in cheek, but also, good point, George. The experiments with dogs seem quite barbaric and pointless now, but Sergei's invention did lead directly to the world's first operations on heart valves. But could the autojector ever have brought humans back to life? No, because your brain would be all f***ed up from lack of oxygen. We know this. Well, according to the book How to Make a Zombie, Real Life and Death, Science of Reanimation and Mind Control by Frank Swain, it sounds as if Sergei had a go. Just three hours after some poor, poor bloke hung himself, Sergei took his body into the lab and hooked the fresh corpse, corpse up to the autojector. Dirty mother. It seems a bit harsh to choose a suicide victim as a guinea pig for your reanimation machine. You're likely, you're hardly likely to get a round of applause from the victim if the experiment turns out to be successful. Yeah, but there's also probably a good reason for it because if someone's died of natural causes, they're still going to be dying. It's like, yeah, they had a heart attack and they died and their heart's all ruined. It's like, okay, well, if we pump him full of blood, his heart is still going to be ruined. If it was a suicide, like, I don't know, by strangulation or something, that's going to be pretty perfect. Dirty mother. <laughs> this got dark, didn't it? It's got real dark. A uh, team of scientists gathered around the corpse as a heartbeat slow beat slowly returned, and the previously dead man's eyes flickered open in a dazed stupor. After just a couple of minutes, the team were consumed by horror at what they were doing and switched off the pumps so the victim could slip back into the warm, soapy bathtub of death. Following the incident, Sergei decided to restrict future experiments purely to dogs. <laughs> Holy s***, guy. I don't believe this. Um, but also, his brain, he'd just be brain dead. Absolutely brain dead. Following this incident, Sergei decided to restrict his future experiments purely to dogs. So maybe there's hope for Simon. In 200 years from now, we might not get a full-bodied Simon in front of the YouTube camera, but we might at least get a largely silent, decapitated head with flickering eyelids. You're welcome, future. We might just need Sam to stick a few extra memes to pad out the content a bit. Vintage memes from the achingly glorious past. Thank you, Danny. This one was extremely dark. Thank you for watching, sticking with it. Remember, if you love dogs, you're probably smashing that dislike button. Thank you for watching, everybody. Do check out Magellan, and I will see you next time. Uh, that's a lot of damage. <laughs>